Good Wednesday morning, everybody. It's like 6.30 in the morning, super early. We're out here at the Kennedy Space Center because there is a rocket launch tomorrow, and I was invited out here by NASA Social to come and experience all things space. So I'm excited. I cannot wait to see what they have in store for us. And then we get prime viewing for the rocket launch. Hopefully it happens. It looks like rain all week. So we'll see what happens. Our first stop is the astronaut training experience, which this is actually getting ready to move over to the visitor center. But this is where our badging is going to be today. I'm gonna put a link to the time that we visited the Astronaut Hall of Fame up in the corner. I'm all badged up and ready to go. We're just waiting to load up on this bus. We just had all of our bags snipped and stuff by this lovely canine police officer. And he does tracking and detection too. Wow. So. Good morning, NASA Social. Woo! First stop is the press site. Here, we're gonna go into this building over here to the annex. Yeah. But then later, they tell us that we're going to tour the vehicle assembly building and launch control, which is very rare. So I'm excited for that. Never been inside launch control before. Been inside the VIB a couple of times, but never launch control. This right here is the main press site where the majority of the press gathers, but then there are a few little buildings here where individual press companies have their own little press boxes like Reuters, Associated Press, and Orlando Sentinel. Here's what we're here to see is the SpaceX launch of CRS-11. It's a resupply mission for the International Space Station. There are currently two commercial resupply spacecraft that we sent to the International Space Station. One of them is over here on the left-hand side. It's called the, the Dragon spacecraft, which is built by SpaceX. That's the spacecraft we're going to see launch tomorrow. The other is called the Cygnus spacecraft on the right-hand side built by Orbital ATK, which is the last launch that we did about a month ago. So what is on board of this spacecraft? NICER is a neutron star imager, basically. Um, just a more advanced ne neutron star imager than what we currently have. And kind of one of the main points of this one is to actually use those neutron stars as almost a GPS system for spacecraft. GPS obviously a little bit different for spacecraft than it is on the ground because GPS relies on satellites pointed down at the Earth and that is not the case for spacecraft. It gets a little bit more complicated for them. The next payload that's going to be going up is called the ROSA experiment and what this one is doing is it is essentially investigating better solar arrays for spacecraft solar panels. Uh, there's something called the Fruit Fly Lab 2. They are hatching some fruit flies in space which I think is pretty cool. Like these are space flies. <laughs> a thousand fruit flies in a contained area, not going like all over the International Space Station. So we're, they're actually hatching these fruit fruit flies in space, and they're comparing how their cardiovascular function is as compared to the fruit flies that are hatched here on Earth. So they have ground controls. So the next one is called Acme, which is essentially it's it's studying the way that fire behaves in space. Um, how fire burns in space, which is also pretty cool. We have an experiment called Seedling Growth 3, which is essentially studying how seeds grow in space. NASA has been doing a lot of experimentation and investigation on growing plants in space because the idea is that the longer that our astronauts are in space, uh, we're going to need to have them actually cultivate food while they are up there. So when we start sending astronauts to places like Mars, the really, really, really long duration missions, there's no way that we can load them up with enough food to last them the entire time that they're on Mars. So they're going to have to grow their own food. We have a mission called Apex 2-2 that studies uh, radiation in space. And it's, study, it's going to be using um, essentially uh, bread. It's going to be using yeast, how radiation levels affect yeast in space. Um, and that's important because the astronauts on the International Space Station, they don't really get exposed to very high levels of radiation. But once we send astronauts into deep space, once we get beyond the Earth's Van Allen belts, those are what protect us from the radiation from the sun. So that's going to become a really, really important thing when we get astronauts out into deep space. First stop. So we launch control. This is where a bunch of the Apollo missions were launched, all the space shuttle missions were launched, and we are actually, there are four launching rooms in that building. We're going to launch room number four, and that is where the last space shuttle mission was launched from. I just noticed all of these wires running through this trough for all the different media outlets. Oh my goodness. This is real exciting. There's a whole wall of mission patches here. That is so amazing. Also, notable ones. Take for instance, Apollo 11, all the way down, STS-35. Oh my gosh, 
And they've got a NASA test director console here. This is amazing. Just a huge chunk of crawler track sitting on the floor over here. This is a piece of track that they used on the vehicle that transported all of the space shuttles out to the pad. I can totally flip a switch on a computer that was used to launch something into space. This is amazing. So this is a space shuttle era console from the launch control center. So this was used to launch space shuttles into space. This is amazing. They made a little arrow out of a Hershey's wrapper. And this is an Apollo era control module. This is the old shuttle air equipment and stuff that's uh, not being utilized. We're heading into firing room four right now. We weren't allowed to film in any of the other two rooms that we were in before, but I'm allowed to film in this one. The first room that we went into was very similar to this one though, but with newer equipment for running the SLS. So this would have been where some of the space shuttle missions were controlled from. Talk, we can so see the two launch pads here. out there. This is firing room four. This was used for the shuttle launches. We've left these top two, three rows still configured as they were for the last shuttle launches. This is the launch director and assistant launch director console that launched the space shuttles. Look, here's all the different tests they would have to go through, like the pre-flight check. That's intense. This is actually from Columbia. So the family members of the Columbia crew. Here's a couple more from the last. Oh. You know each other? <clears throat> this is amazing. So it became a tradition for the family members to draw on a whiteboard before every shuttle mission. Next stop on the tour, we're headed into the VAB. We are headed in to the vehicle assembly building right now. This isn't even the highest spot inside of it. It's pretty impressive stuff. This is where they assembled all of the Apollo missions and all of the space shuttles. The way that they test the crane operators, if you look up, you'll see these yellow things crossing, crossing the, uh, the, the walkway. Those are cranes that they use to pick up the spacecraft and assemble them. The way that they test the crane operators is that they have to, uh, to balance something on top of an egg without breaking it using those cranes. So these are like the best crane operators in the world. There are parts of the building that are like office space that do have heating and cooling, but for the most part, it's just a giant hangar. This is a big old building. Right now we are about in the center of the VAB and you can see over here is a high bay and over here is another high bay where they would assemble all of the space missions. And you can see one of the platforms right here for assembling the space vehicles. Once we finally get SLS ready to launch, it will come very close to the ceiling up there. That's a, that's a space capsule. There's, there's a space capsule right there. So they would assemble the space vehicles on this platform right here and then drive the crawler underneath it lift it up and then drive it out to the launch pads. I don't know if this is true or not, but the guys that landed on the moon, Buzz Aldrin, Neil Armstrong, heard that they signed their names up on the roof rafters up there. Never been up there to check, but that's just a rumor that I heard. She just said that this bay over here is where they're gonna start assembling the SLS and they just finished installing all the platforms that will fit around the SLS rocket. So they assemble the rocket in a vertical position inside of this building and then they have to get it all the way out to the launch pad. The launch pad is three and a half miles away from this building. How on earth do you get a rocket in a vertical position from this building all the way out to the launch pad three and a half miles away? Really slowly. He nailed it. <laughs> Very slowly for Columbia, for STS-107, which unfortunately that crew did not make it back. Their space shuttle broke up on re-entry to the Earth's atmosphere. Um, not many people know where Columbia is. I can tell you Columbia is inside of this building. It's about 16 stories above your head right now. 
a special room where they have laid out all of the parts that they have recovered of Columbia, kind of in the configuration of the space shuttle. And what they use that for is the universities who are doing studies on things like safety and mission assurance and quality assurance. So we found out this is a test article for the Starliner capsule. So it's not an actual space craft. It's just like a test fitting unit. They have a new display on here for the VAB upgrades for the SLS, but then you can see what was left over burned in from the space shuttle era. They have some pictures here of the space shuttle being assembled inside of the VAB and you can see here is them attaching it to a crane so they can because they roll it in here flat and they flip it upright and then attach it to the solid rocket boosters and the external fuel tank another little homage to Columbia up there right there STS 107 it's lunchtime and this place is interesting because this nondescript building actually houses a subway and a uh, Sunny's barbecue funny thing is this is usually just uh, available to NASA employees we're headed back over to the press site here and you can see countdown clock is going for CRS-11, which is the launch that we are going to be seeing. We're in the press briefing room just waiting to go over what's on board briefing. This is going to be live, too. You can see all the cameras set up. Dragon is just about packed and ready to launch atop of Falcon 9 uh, uh, tomorrow at 5.55 p.m. in the Cool thing about this technology demo that we're gonna to try to do with NICER is that neutron stars are distributed around the galaxy. And, and so we can actually build a system that allows us to navigate from lower Earth orbit into the solar system and beyond. And Everyone's familiar with GPS, but our goal is to turn the G and GPS into galactic, make it a galactic business system. And the goal of the work we're doing in collaboration with NASA is to understand the role of microgravity in cardiac function. On um, astronaut heart function, in order to try to prevent long-term effects um, when they are in space for long periods and after they come back. So we have developed a number of ways to look at heart function in the fruit fly. So they will be going up to the ISS for approximately half of their lifespan and coming back where we will then bring them into the lab and perform a number of assays on them. We will be sending up approximately 90 vials like this. This is essentially a self-contained unit that can house thousands of flies. In fact, we'll be sending up approximately 4,000 to 6,000 eggs that will um, hatch on the ISS. And when they come back, we'll be able to analyze their heart function having spent half their life in microgravity. But we're also interested in something called epigenetics. What happens to the babies that those adults produce? So once they come back, we'll let them have offspring and we will raise those to approximately the same age as the parents that we analyzed. And we will then analyze their heart function to see if there are lasting effects in subsequent generations from uh, prolonged microgravity exposure. And with that, that about wraps up our time here for today. We're gonna come back tomorrow, but I'm kinda glad we're leaving today because there is a rainstorm coming. And that's gonna do it for us for today. Got lots more tomorrow because tomorrow is the launch officially. So we'll be back at NASA tomorrow. We'll see you guys tomorrow. Now it's time to pay the price.